I've been a critic of capitalism pretty much my adult life. Over the last 10 years, I have done more invited public speaking than in the previous 40. The, the United States has become open and interested in these critiques in a way I never thought I would live to see. Where do we go from here? You know, I think we'd all agree that things are pretty messed up unless you're Larry Page, Sergey Brin, mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> Bill Gates, whatever, right? right. Um, uh, you right. know, uh, we, we would all agree that it's, it's you know, and in Lou Dobbs' book, which I quote often, War on the Middle Class from years ago, you know, he talks about how the rank and file worker versus this, the C-level execs, the the pay, the, the it, it's just, it's, it's astronomical how out of proportion that is nowadays compared to how it was years ago. I mean, it was right. it was in Absolutely. line, you know, that the, the the head honcho always gets paid more. That's we get that right. Nobody would object to that in principle. But the proportion is staggering what Jamie right. Dimon were, makes versus, you know, one of his uh, his his serfs. <laughs> right. Um, right. So so how do we solve that? I mean, it's we got to redistribute wealth, right? That's the only way you do it. A few months ago, maybe it's a year ago, I was on a Fox News town hall, and uh, they had two of us on the sort of the left, and then they had their four big shots on the right. One of which was Lou Dobbs. Mm -hmm. And after the it lasted an hour of the show. After the show was over. Lou Dobbs was eager to talk to me, mm -hmm. which I found interesting. Okay. Yeah, Lou, Lou Dobbs so, would not disagree with you completely. I no, mean, he, yeah. he, he was taken yeah. with, obviously, and he it was very friendly and all that. And uh, But that's what he wanted to talk about. Yeah. He, was, he, he and I both, I think I had made some comment about how back in the 1960s, uh, the CEO got 50 or 60 times. Yeah, now it's like 400 times. Yeah, it's that's absurd, right, three yeah. or 400 yeah. is, is where it is now. And there's no rational basis. Right. I mean, you're not going to argue he's that much more productive. I mean, it's just silly. Um, and he and I agreed on that. And and I said to him, you know, if you had a democratic way of deciding on salaries, the workers themselves could be counted on to pay more to people they thought were more crucial to what the company did, had maybe some skills, had to go learn for a while in the university to, yeah. to acquire. They, they, they wouldn't give everybody the same amount of money. They, they get that. Yeah, you know I mean, right, right, right. Yeah, no, and I, I agree that they and, do get that. Yeah, and yeah. You know what? He looked at me with this funny look. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Mm -hmm. He didn't comment on what I was yeah. saying one way or the other. But, you know, being a teacher all my life, I look at the student's eyes, I looked at his eyes. I don't, I mean, I don't mean this to be critical because I had a nice talk with him. Mm -hmm. I don't think he had ever thought of it that way. I mean, he, when he asks himself well, the question. Well, that's the co-op <laughs> idea, right? The, co the company, yeah. the employee-owned company concept, right? But, I, but I, no, 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 no. Not ownership. Okay. What, when I say co-op, I'm talking about what, the better word would be directorship. Mm -hmm. The workers become collectively their own employer, their own board of directors. Mm -hmm. This is complete. You know, you can have an uh, an employee stock ownership plan, and mm -hmm. we have many of those in this yeah, country, sure. where workers get, you know, X percent of the yeah. shares or something like that. The problem with that is, whatever you think of it per se, is that the workers are usually either in fact incompetent or unsure of how to run a company. So what they do as owners is the same thing anybody does as owners. You basically vote for, turn over the company to your dele delegates, your, yeah. your board of directors right. that you elect each year. It's a representative year. republic concept. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so they do that too. And then what they look at the shares, the way most share, small shareholders do, this is a source of a quarterly check. But beyond that, I don't give a damn. I don't know what's going on in the company. I'm not involved. Yeah. Uh, I bought it because my broker told me it was a good deal or something like that. So I'm talking about when workers literally become the collective directors, designers. They run their own business. 
They don't even have to own can, it. Can, can a company with 80,000 workers really do that? Is everything voted on? I mean, sure. the, I mean, the problem is in those employee stock owned companies that you mentioned a moment ago, you know, we have that all over the place. And because of the separation of the C-level executives and the boards of directors and what's known in, in law as the business judgment rule, you know, it's like Congress. They can just give themselves perks endlessly. And, you know, there's no accountability for that. Yeah, they could maybe vote them out, but that's harder than it looks. So right. how do we do that? How do, what's the well, real mechanics of that? I, let me answer it by describing to you a company that has done it. Okay. So that we, we don't have it in the realm of me uh, I don't want people to imagine I'm suggesting how it could be done. Okay. I prefer to be the messenger who tells you how it's already being done. All right. Probably the single most uh, powerful and, and a successful uh, worker co-op in the world is called the Mondragon Corporation. Uh, it's based in Spain um, and in the city of Mondragon, which is a small city in the north of Spain, in the uh, foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains. Uh, in 1956, a Catholic priest uh, gave a famous talk in a little church in Mondragon, and he said to the workers there, very, very poor part of Spain, uh, if we wait for someone to come here and give us jobs, we will all die of old age before that happens. And everybody laughed. And then he, then he made his pitch. He said, let's become our own employer. There are six of you in this room who are carpenters or whatever the hell they were. Let's start a co-op. We will employ ourselves. So he starts in 1956 uh, with six workers and the Catholic priest. Today, that company has uh, about 130,000 employees. It is the seventh largest corporation in all of Spain. It is organized as a family of about 200 or 250 individual worker co-ops doing manufacturing, services, a whole range of activities. Um, and they organize each of those businesses as a worker co-op, where all the decisions are made collectively by the 50, the 500, the 10,000 employees, depending on what it is. Uh, I'll give you an idea of how they've succeeded. Six people in 1956, 130,000. That would be the envy of any capitalist corporation, such a level of growth. Mm -hmm. Number two, along the way, they competed with many capitalist enterprises, and they outcompeted them, and it, uh, eventually ended up absorbing them, their mm -hmm. workers, their used materials, their equipment. Uh, number three, they have a rule that the highest paid worker in a co-op across the 130,000, cannot get paid more than eight and a half times what the lowest paid was. They have no inequality like the United States in those parts of Spain, mostly in the north where they are located. Okay, um, once, uh, once a year they have an assembly where the workers vote on the supervisors. Not the other way around. Mm -hmm. The workers vote whether to retain a supervisor or to let him or her go. Mm -hmm. um, it's an extraordinary development. I have gone there myself. So I'm not only talking about reading about it and all that. I visited the place. It blows my mind. Very well organized. Okay. All right. Oops. Yeah, that's you great. Know, it is. It's doable. 